preventative maintenance is free compared to reversing aging, which is what I've spent a couple million bucks doing. Um, when is the right time? I mean, is it 30? Is it 25? Is it 35? When do you start stem regen? If we, let, let's speak theoretically, because, okay. because it's, it's a recent science, it's a recent product. It, but it's okay to say it should be this way, but we don't have a clinical We don't study. have a background. Yeah. We don't have like the 50 yeah. years behind it. Sure. So now that we know that there's a point in your 30s where you don't have enough stem cells to offset cellular loss. That means now you start to, be, to, to build a deficit in the equation of losing cells in your tissues and replacing them. That means the disease that you'll develop in 20, 30 years from now started today. And so when I published this whole view of the role of stem cells in aging in 2013, the data was not there. It was pointing in that direction. In that, in that article, I said, there's one way to prove if this is true. Let's go and count the number of stem cells in the bloodstream of people who have developed any so-called age-related disease. And let's compare that to healthy people. Today, many of these studies have been done. There's probably about 50 of those. You count the number of stem cells in people with diabetes, heart disease, uh, liver failure, kidney failure, COPD, erectile dysfunction, atherosclerosis, Parkinson, lupus, arthritis, and the list keeps growing. They all have across the board 50% or less than the number of stem cells that you find in healthy people. So conceptually, yeah. what that means is that the person who is healthy at 70 years old, he's just happened to have a, a, a genetics that make him have naturally more stem cells in circulation than others. Everything is dictated by how many stem cells you have every day for the rest of your life to repair. Once we understand this, my view is like, start to put more stem cells every day. And then you maintain that the function of organs. And in my book, we, have, we don't have enough time right now to look at it. But in my book, if there's one strategy for longevity, you can do a lot of things to, to biohack your body. But from a longevity standpoint, start by the, the, the starting point, the building block of health in the body, support the, innate, the body's innate ability to maintain its own health, it's mm -hmm. your stem cells. Okay. In my longevity book, uh, Superhuman, and this is a book, by the way, it says, here's how you can add several decades to your life. It's a longevity book. There are some recent books out by people who claim they're in the longevity space, and their book says, we can't extend human lifespan. Your best bet is to just exercise a lot, take statins and get extra vaccines. Literally one of the top books on the New York Times right now. And I'm just laughing. I'm like, this is, this is a Luddite book. And it's actually embarrassing. So I'm, yeah, I'm in 40 hopeful. years, we'll say, oops, it yeah. didn't work. <laughs> it's like, maybe someday we'll extend human life by 10 years. And I'm like, this alone has that. And this is only one of seven pillars of aging that I read about. Stem cell exhaustion is one of the seven things. If you only fix your stem cells and your mitochondria are trash, it's probably not going to work because mitochondria power stem it's cells. It's not the only thing. Yeah, you do them together. But if your mitochondria work and you have no stem cells, you're still going to age. Exactly. So this looks like something that compared to interventional stuff is far more cost effective. And you actually get more cells this way anyway. And there are some, some treatments coming down the line. I'm working with a company on iPSC edited stem cells that have certain longevity properties. And I'll be getting those. And you inject those. They're not umbilical cells from random people. They're tested, characterized, and then edited to do specific things. Mm -hmm. uh, so would I do that and stem regen to keep my own stem cell things topped up? Heck yes, I would. Yeah, because the moment that you in inject the stem cells or introduce a new stem cells in your body. If you're talking about iPSC, then they're your own that have been sort of tweaked. Yeah. The moment you put them back in your bloodstream, they go to the bone marrow. That's their natural function. Like in today's world, for example, you have cancer treatment, we, you get irradiation, chemotherapy, whatever, then we give you back your stem cells. You don't need to inject them in the bone marrow. Just put them in the bloodstream. Right. They go to the bone marrow, they reconstitute the bone marrow. The moment you inject one of these stem cells, it will go into your bone marrow. Now you use stem regen and you force it, not force it. You support it to get back yeah. into circulation and go and work in the body. Wow, th this is cool stuff. And I'll say, if you look at some weird herb that we've been using for 5,000 years, they couldn't spell stem cell. They didn't know what stem cells were. And it reminds me of one of my favorite uh, recollections. And this is this is from a book on shamanism, I think an encyclopedia of it, uh, where they introduced scientists, Western scientists, uh, talking about 
Oh, I think this was Candace Pert's book, which is, she's a woman who discovered the opiate receptor. And uh, so they put shamans and molecular biologists together. And the biologists are explaining these signaling molecules and how you can have, you know, a receptor for opiates. And, and the shamans just start laughing and laughing. And they go, you think those things exist? Right? And yet they both agreed on the same practices. But one picture was very molecular and one picture was very esoteric. Uh, and they both were like, cannot be, but the results were the same. Yeah. And so this sounds like one of those examples. It, 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 what you just described is my approach. Like as a scientist, I, what I produce is very modern Western science, but my inspiration and my thought process is to look at what worked in history because that is real. A double blind placebo controlled study is telling you what, I ha what has happened in those 50 individuals. And they're telling you that this will be true for everybody. What is more true? Is what happened in these 50 people or what people have used for a thousand years and it worked for them? So for me, I, I base a lot of that research on historical experience uh, of, of what has been the use of these plants. And that's how I choose the plants that, you know, that are part of the product.